we're going to start off with something Irene Tasker, FM Alexander's secretary, said when recalling a lesson she observed Alexander give in 1938. She said, I still have the notes I made about these lessons, and one instruction FM gave him has remained vividly with me ever since. After explaining how the coming forward movement in the chair always makes people cramp the chest and shorten, he said, Never let the body overrun the head in coming forward. Never let the head overrun the body in going backward. While the context of this comment is in leaning forward and backward in sitting, this is a valuable idea in almost every situation. We've already seen in this series that the traditional advice around forward head posture is faulty. This is further confirmation that Alexander fully understood that the head should be forward of the torso. Alexander often uses the word body in a situation like this, but we can understand him as meaning the torso. This is an idea we looked at before in the series about the torso. When people lean forward, they will often shove their lower sternum and lower ribs forward faster than their head. That is, the body overruns the head in coming forward. Let's also think about what happens when we sit down into a chair. Typically, once we've landed on the chair, we will need to untilt our torso so that we're upright again. You'll find that most people will pull their head and upper sternum back much faster than their lower sternum and lower ribs. As a result, their head will be pulled back, and their torso will be bent. That is, the head overruns the body in going backward. We're going to create a direction to help us implement this idea that Alexander has put forward. We'll define the ponytail spot as the spot at the back of the head where you would have a ponytail. The direction will be to pull this ponytail spot forward and up. Obviously, we are going to use this direction in conjunction with other directions. For instance, if you're going to lean forward on a chair, you can add this direction to the directions you're already applying to your torso. Really, this is just another leverage point from which to extend the neck and upper torso. A fun way to look at this idea of not wanting the head to overrun the body in going back is to walk backwards. Because we don't walk backwards very often, our habits are not nearly as strong as in walking forward. So it can be easier for us to see our habits and counter them when walking backwards. Just as in walking forward, we want our torso to lead the movement. You may have heard that walking is like falling, and so walking backwards is like falling backwards. If we pull our head and shoulders back, we will have too much weight back and will likely struggle with our balance. We can use all the typical directions we would use for the torso as we walk backwards. If we add on this forward and up movement of the ponytail spot, we should be able to keep our head well forward of the back line of the body as we move backwards. Let your torso move first and have your legs catch up. Don't initiate the movement by stepping back. You also want to make sure you're not dropping your head down when you move it forward. That will sometimes happen if you pull your sit bones and lower sacrum back faster than you pull your upper sacrum and iliacs back. Doing that will tilt your pelvis, and your rib cage will go down in space. While the head is an interesting additional thing to consider, keeping the torso lengthened and widened is what will help you maintain your head poised atop your spine. So focus on that first. If you're having trouble, you can try this. Grab on to the lower end of your shirt on the opposite side of your body. You want your hand to be around the height of the lowest ribs on the side of the rib cage. Do this on both sides. If you pull your right hand to the right and your left hand to the left, you can narrow your rib cage at the front and widen the back. Do this as you walk backwards. If we look at the head in many pictures of so-called good posture, we see that the head is actually tilted back and down at this ponytail spot. As a result, the whole head is tilted back, and the eyes will be looking more up than forward. This will also obviously pull the corner of the eye spot back and down. If you look at people with an underbite, they tend to have a very exaggerated pulling back and down of the ponytail spot. While this adjustment of the head can seem very powerful when you first try it out, 
remember that this adjustment is just another piece that goes along with the overall adjustment of the whole body. If you, for instance, do not get your lower ribs to rotate back at the same time, you will have a hard time keeping your head forward. We don't want to narrow our vision to the head. We want this to broaden our view as we bring another consideration into our model. This quote from Irene Tasker is not really a well-known one. Jean Do Masuero is the one who brought it to my attention. I don't think it's hard to understand why. This advice to not let the body overrun the head when going forward, and not let the head overrun the body in going back, is counter to what a lot of people would think of as right. But it lines up exactly with many things we've already looked at in this series. I do think it's interesting to hear it plainly said by Alexander, and it confirms our understanding of the head's relationship with the torso. This simple idea can really be effective in helping us confront and change our habits of movement, so try using it in your day-to-day -day life. You should now have a decent idea of what typically goes wrong in people's neck and head. You should also have some tools and ideas to counteract those problems. Spend a little time seeing if you are really clear on how we want to reorient the head. I'd also like you to think about something we haven't really talked about so far. Having a free neck is a very well-known aspect of the Alexander Technique, but we haven't looked specifically at the neck all that much. But at the same time, we've looked at a lot of different adjustments that will have a real effect on the neck. So what is a free neck anyway? Give some thought to what we've looked at so far in this series, then join me next episode, and we'll tie together what we've learned so far, and unite our understanding of the neck and head with the rest of the body.